on orthopedic principle. This time, we have distinguished faculty, Professor Dane Vukic from Dallas, Texas. Professor Dane Vukic is professor and chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UT Southwestern, where he holds the Charles Gregory Chair in Orthopedic Surgery. He's also the medical director of orthopedic surgery at Southwestern University Hospitals. Dr. Vukic received his undergraduate education from Carnegie Mellon University and earned his medical degree at Georgetown University School of Medicine. He completed his general surgery residency and orthopedic surgery residency at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, followed by a fellowship in foot and ankle surgery at Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Vukic served in operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield. He achieved the rank of major with the US Army, receiving several Army Commendation Medals and an Army Achievement Medal. Dr. Vukic also received the Southwest Asia Services Medal and the National Defense Services Ribbon. Dr. Vukic is a nationally renowned foot and ankle specialist, educator, lecturer, and researcher. He has written more than 150 publications and given invited lectures around the globe. He serves as peer reviewer for 11 journals and is a co-author or author for several book chapters dealing with foot and ankle problems in athletes and patients with diabetes. His research interest includes the complications of circular external fixation in patients with diabetes, foot and ankle problems in post-transplant patients, and treatment of spastic deformity in the foot and ankle in patients with traumatic brain injury or stroke. He remains actively involved in the education of orthopedic surgery, not only around the world, but also at Western Orthopedics. Dr. Vukic is both certified by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and is a member of numerous professional organizations, including the American Academy, the American Foot and Ankle Society, the American Orthopedic Association, and the American Diabetes Association. With this introduction, may I introduce Professor Dane Vukic to take over. Can you share your screen, Prof? sharing. Let me just put this up. Can you see it now? Whoops, let me uh, yeah. let me go back to the beginning here, get it set up. How's that? Can you see that okay? Yes, Rob. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And hopefully uh, today we'll learn a little bit about the management of ankle fractures in patients with diabetes. So as with any presentation, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Orthofix and Wright Medical and also receive royalties from Arthrex. And at any point during the discussion, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to um, ask them and we can certainly uh, take them as we go. So the goals of this presentation are to understand that diabetic bone is different than normal bone and to recognize the seriousness of ankle fractures in patients with diabetes. And this is an example of a case you can see, ends up looking good, but then once you fix it, um, things fall apart for whatever reason. So the question that I always ask myself is how and why does this happen? Here's an example of a really well-reduced ankle fracture with multiple uh, tetracortical screws and with time, this falls apart. And it's amazing that this happens more commonly in patients with diabetes and especially in patients with neuropathy. So what do we know about diabetes? We know that if you have an ankle fracture, you have a much higher increased likelihood of having an adverse event in somebody who undergoes surgery. And you can see that I'm going to cite three different articles from the last three years, 2018 in injury, 2019 in the journal foot and ankle surgery, and another one uh, just recently. So this is not something new, and despite our great techniques, we still encounter significant complication rates. Now, ankle fractures are common, and every orthopedic surgeon or foot and ankle surgeon is going to see a lot of ankle fractures, because if we look at trauma centers, at least in the United States, about half of all the fractures of the foot and ankle that come in are related to ankle fractures. And if you look at the National Trauma Data Bank over a 10 year period, there were about 150,000 ankle fractures. Now that doesn't include ankle fractures that go to community hospitals or hospitals that don't need multiple trauma, which is the multiple, uh, I think the majority of these patients don't go to trauma centers. So it's a tremendous number of injuries that we see in patients 
uh, who have ankle fractures. What about the epidemiology? Again, if you look at this in the United States, it's over a half a million people have ankle fractures per year in the United States. And I'm sure that other uh, larger countries have equally high rates. In our population, almost 10% of our population has diabetes. So that would translate in that we're seeing about 50,000 patients a year with diabetes who experience an ankle fracture. That, that translates to about 150 ankle fractures on any given day. Now, if you look at our national so, uh, surgical quality improvement data from the American College of Surgeons, they looked at data from 600 uh, different hospitals. And uh, one of our medical students here uh, researched the data and they look at outcomes only in the first 30 days of treatment. But it's interesting what you can find by looking at a large database. We found that readmission rates were higher and we identified about 17,000 patients who underwent ankle fracture surgery. Of those, about 12% had diabetes, which is higher than our general population. And we found that the readmission rate, as you can see, was significantly higher in the patients with diabetes. And that was a result of surgical site infections, fracture complications, uh, venous thromboembolism, and even wound dehiscences. But you also look at reoperation rates, and you can see that our reoperation rates, mortality rates, and length of stay were also significantly worse in patients with diabetes. And then when you look at all these patients, we adjusted for age, because obviously age plays a role. We adjusted for comorbidities such as obesity, the use of steroids, hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, renal disease, and functional independence. And when we adjusted for all that, we still found that patients with diabetes had higher readmission rates and higher reoperation rates than non-diabetic patients. Now, what are the limitations of a large database like this or any other database? It's always retrospective. Participation in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program is actually voluntary. And it only records data for the first 30 days. And we know that patients have complications beyond the 30 days. And it doesn't record surgeon-specific data, such as the method of fixation, the surgeon experience, or the hospital volume. So with that in mind, if there are any questions, we can stop and, and just talk a little bit about the epidemiology. And if not, I can proceed and uh, continue to go. Any questions thus far? Yeah, proceed, Fun. Okay. So if we look at this, this is the worldwide map. And you get the impression that diabetes is clearly on the increase, uh, not only in Western societies, but more importantly, in in developing countries as well. And Asia is a particularly important uh, component of this. So patients with diabetes um, have increased risks of fractures and falls. And we know that they have increased risks of fractures. And why is that? Because they have bone fragility. But they also have increased risk of falls. And why would that be? Well, there are many reasons. One would be postural control. Two would be that they would have myopathy or even sarcopenia, muscle wasting. They have gait de deficits, which are oftentimes due to some underlying neuropathy. They have retinopathy. Sometimes they can't see as well. And, and oftentimes they are overweight, uh, which contributes to this. And finally, diabetic patients can actually drop their sugar and actually become hypoglycemic, and that can be a source of fall. So our patients have an increased risk of both falling and also fracturing. What are the generally accepted facts that we know? Patients with diabetes type one have higher risk of fractures. Patients with type two diabetes also have a higher risk of fractures, but it's lower than type one. And we also know that type one diabetes is associated with lower bone mineral density, while type two diabetes is associated with a normal bone mineral density. So the question that you would ask is if type two diabetes, which is the predominant diabetes type has normal bone density, why would their risk of fracture be increased? And it's because the DEXA scan, which measures uh, bone mineral density, does not measure bone quality. And so normal bone mass does not equal normal bone quality. And so you can see representative sections of the 
spine here that you might have um, relatively normal bone mass, but your quality could be significantly impaired. We also know that the bone mineral density does not explain the difference in fracture risk. So the quality of bone is really what matters in these patients. And so advanced glycosylation end products are called ages. They accumulate in collagen, not only in, in bone, but also in tendons. They can make tendons stiffer, but they also will stiffen bone. And this is not measurable by a DEXA scan. So, you know, morphologically, our bone is not normal, despite the fact that we may have a normal bone mass. Now, we also know that patients with diabetes have higher prevalence of ankle fractures uh, than other parts of their bodies compared to the wrist. So why would somebody have a higher rate of an ankle fracture and not a wrist fracture uh, if they have impaired bone quality? Because it's not, it's not localized just to the foot and ankle. And the reason for this is that ankle fractures are associated with patients who have increased um, you know, obesity and their body mass index. And so here's an ankle fracture in a, in a gentleman and you look at him and you can see that he is uh, significantly in fact, morbidly obese. Whereas the wrist fracture, it's not something that we, we, are bait, we wear, bear weight on. And so it doesn't have the same type of uh, risk for uh, fracturing. So what about bone healing in diabetes? Uh, this was a systematic review uh, recently published in Injury. And what they talked about in, when patients have diabetes, it's somewhat of an inflammatory state. And so uh, TGF beta is, is a, an inflammatory marker that actually decreases osteoblast maturation, which is going to impact uh, healing. And we also notice, notice that hyperglycemia impairs cellular mechanisms and will increase uh, the possibility of impaired healing as well. Now it's interesting, when they looked at all lower extremity fractures from the hip down to the ankle, what they found that diabetes uh, was not associated with an increased risk of non-union or delayed union in the overall cohort, which was somewhat interesting. So they were surprised by this and they then took out, di uh, took out hip fractures and eliminated it and just look at ankle fractures, tibia fractures and pilon fractures. And what they found that the non-union rate was seven times higher in patients with diabetes if you excluded hip fractures. So clearly fractures distal to the hip in patients with diabetes are associated with higher rates of non-union. And it was also associated with a six-fold increased risk of malunion, three-fold increase in infection, and a five-fold increased risk in reoperation. This was a very elegant fracture uh, model created in a, in a diabetic rat uh, by Gandhi and his group in New Jersey in 2005. And as you can see on the left, they created a, a non-diabetic fracture. And if you look at the callus there, that's what mature, healthy callus looks like. In a diabetic rat that was not treated with any insulin, you can see that the callus was very immature and there was a lot of fibrous tissue. And then on the right, you could see what the diabetic uh, rat that was treated with local delivery of insulin, the callus looks very, very similar to a non-diabetic. So clearly local delivery insulin in, an, in a rat model showed that callus matured very nicely. And this was published in Bone in 2005. We also know that hyperglycemia fuels osteoclastic activities. It suppresses osteoblastic gene expression and it impairs the proliferative response of osteoblast insulin growth factor. So perioperative hyperglycemia is very important if we want to reduce the rate of complications. And we also know that the cell surface receptor for advanced glycosylation end products is expressed at higher levels in patients with diabetes versus non-diabetes. So clearly hyperglycemia is a problem uh, in the perioperative period in particular. And these AGEs stiffen the, the bone and makes it uh, different. We, we see that diabetes will actually heal. You can see a malunion here, but the bone actually is healing, but we know that insulin is actually a growth factor and it contributes to fracture healing. It's an anabolic uh, hormone. And so the optimal perioperative glucose should also have a beneficial effect on fracture healing, especially during that early proliferative phase. So amongst all the things that we do, 
managing the perioperative glycemic control is very important. We can't do much about the long-term uh, glycemic control as measured by your hemoglobin A1C uh, during the perioperative period, but we certainly can monitor this. And really that's where our endocrinologists, hospitalists and internists really can have a big impact. So in the future, it may be that local delivery of growth factors may play a role. We can deliver them locally at the site of fracture. So what is the mechanism of increased fractures in patients with diabetes? Well, they have decreased bone strength and they have an increased fall risk and that results in a fracture. And similarly, we have bone density and bone quality interacting to affect the bone strength that will result in a fracture as well. I think it's important to talk about vitamin D because patients with diabetes have lower levels of vitamin D than patients without uh, diabetes. And this was published by Yoho in 2009. And the question is, which comes first? There are some people that think a vitamin D deficiency may actually contribute to diabetes. There are others that, others that think that the diabetes present and causes vitamin D deficiency. Regardless of this, we know that vitamin D deficiency results in a decrease in calcium absorption. That causes an impaired bone quality and could lead to a fragility fracture. So in my opinion, a lot of these patients with diabetes who experience an ankle fracture really are similar to a geriatric fracture or slash a fragility fracture. So any other questions at this point before we move on? Not exactly, Prof, you can carry on. Okay, so the way I look at this is I look at diabetes, whether it's complicated or non-complicated. And this is just, this is kind of my thought process that a complicated uh, diabetic patient may have neuropathy or peripheral artery disease, renal disease, and the renal disease may or may not be end stage, and they, they also have poorly controlled diabetes. And so if somebody has uncomplicated diabetes, they don't have any of these problems, in general, they perform very similarly to patients without diabetes. But when you have complicated diabetes and you get a fracture, this is what can happen. You know, a fracture falls apart. And I think you can look at this x-ray and you can see that that patient's in a split. This is not something that happened, you know, this is relatively soon after surgery and this has fallen apart and the patient broke, broke the plate. Neuropathy and peripheral artery disease are related. If you look at patients with peripheral artery disease, a very high percentage of them have underlying neuropathy. Together, that's an ominous complication in patients with diabetes. And if you have end-stage renal disease, that's an even worse situation. The, uh, the picture on your right shows the trifurcation of the popliteal artery, which is classically uh, where the diabetes patients will get their peripheral artery disease. It's a distal problem, distal to the trifurcation. Now, my own personal experience, uh, we looked up in 2011 and published this, and we had a mean follow-up of 21 months, but everybody had at least six months. And we looked at two groups. We divided them in the complicated group, as I had previously mentioned, and uncomplicated group. And when we segregated them like this, what we found that there was a higher rate of overall complications in complicated diabetes versus uncomplicated diabetes. And that included infections, non-unions, malunions, and even Charcot. And the odds ratio was 3.8, and it was significant. When we looked at total infections, both deep and superficial independently, we found that diabetic patients who had complicated diabetes had a two times higher infection rate than uncomplicated, but it didn't reach statistical significance with the numbers available. When we looked at deep infections, they were almost three times more common in complicated diabetes, and there was a strong trend. Again, it was underpowered to reach statistical significance, but clearly that's clinically meaningful data. There was a threefold increased risk of non-infection complications such as non-union, malunions, and Charcot, and that was statistically significant. And the need for revision surgery in our patients was more than four times higher if you had complicated diabetes because they would fall apart. When we looked at the need for amputation, it was not statistically significantly higher. And again, it was probably underpowered, but they had about two times the uh, rate of uh, non-complicated diabetes. 
So you might ask with all these high complication rates of diabetes and ankle fractures undergoing surgery, <clears throat> why would you operate on them? So what about the non-operative treatment of displaced ankle fractures? Well, the, the results are terrible. They're unacceptably high complication rates. Um, in fact, this most recent article that I'm going to cite had a 21 times higher complication rate non-operative treatment. And this is an example of a patient you can see here that has got a relatively good looking ankle with diabetes. And I'll show you this, what happened to this particular ankle. But they lose reduction. They end up with a Charcot joint. They actually get wound complications because they develop a wound from deformity, not from a surgical wound. They have higher reoperation rates and they can even result in an amputation. The most recent article that supports this was from 2017, but there are also articles from 20 years ago that show exactly the same thing. So despite our improvement, um, we know that non-operative treatment of displaced ankle fractures, particularly in patients with neuropathy, uh, do terribly. So this is that patient that I showed that I had the opportunity to see. I think we look at this x-ray and it looks relatively benign. And this patient was treated non-surgically. There are some things that would indicate that it might be unstable, but a lot of people see this and not a problem. And this is what happened to this particular ankle, that it fell apart um, and developed a uh, varus deformity and the distal tibia eroded and the ankle sublux. So ankle uh, fractures should not be treated non-surgically in patients with neuropathy in particular. The important points, you must recognize the presence of neuropathy before surgery. And I think if you don't look for it, uh, you're not going to recognize it. Patients oftentimes don't know that they have it. And in fact, if you touch their foot and ask them if they can feel it and their eyes are open, universally they say yes. I think you have to use something like the monofilament with their eyes closed. But certainly you do not need to be a neurologist to know that somebody has neuropathy if they walk in on an ankle fracture that's displaced. Do they have minimal pain? Most of these hurt quite a bit. Was it a low energy injury, such as a ground level fall? Think of it as a fragility fracture. You also must recognize if peripheral artery disease is present because your ankle brachial index and your pulses can be very misleading. And remember that the ABI can be falsely elevated in patients from medial artery calcinosis. We actually like to use the uh, toe brachial index and the toe pressures in patients with diabetes. Pulses may not be palpable in patients who uh, have swelling, but you can't say that you can't feel them because of swelling. I do not recommend that you proceed with any surgery in a patient with diabetes if you cannot palpate the pulses and prove that they're present. You can measure the toe pressures and the toe brachial index, which are more reliable in patients with diabetes, particularly neuropathy. You can look at transcutaneous oxygen potentials, but more importantly, you don't want to end up like this in a patient. So what about revision surgery? And we looked up a, an experience, a small experience that I had, 17 patients referred to me uh, with similar x-rays like you see here that had fallen apart. And we found that all 17 of the patients had neuropathy. 16 of them had had a previous closed injury, one had an open injury, and all failed their initial surgery. And the reasons for that were 11 out of 17 because of mechanical failure, Five had an infection, which included osteomyelitis, and uh, one patient had an aseptic nonunion. And so we looked at revision surgery, and at the time that I uh, performed this, I repeated the revision ORF in three patients. Eight of them I treated with reduction in external fixation, and six did a primary arthrodesis. What did we find? We had a limb salvage rate of 82%. 14 of them, and we were to save their ankles. And it's interesting that all of them at the time of follow-up had a clinically fused ankle, regardless of whether we attempted to fuse them. Of the patients that I saw that we salvaged, two of the 14 or 14% 14 had a preoperative infection, most did not. We looked at the three patients who had undergone an amputation and all three of those patients had an infection um, from the initial surgery. What did I learn from this? that it's difficult to achieve a functional ankle joint with revision surgery 
And the goal should be a fusion. Even if you don't try and fuse them, you get them into good position, ultimately their ankle is not going to move and clinically they're going to end up with a fused ankle. But that's not such a bad thing. So the question is, what about primary fusion? Is there ever a role that you should consider primary fusion of an ankle fracture that's displaced in a diabetic patient? And there was a recent study that was published about six months ago that looked at a patient and these x-rays are from this particular article where they had 27 patients, 20 of them had neuropathy, five had nephropathy, none of them were on a dialysis and two had peripheral artery disease. The interesting thing about this article is they did not prepare the joints. They basically did a closed retrograde uh, ankle fusion. And then uh, surprisingly as well, they allowed them to weight bear in a boot uh, after surgery. Traditionally, as uh, reconstructive surgeons, we're uh, advocates of preparing joints. And certainly we're very nervous about letting somebody with neuropathy weight bear in a boot. So what are their results? They had a limb salvage rate of 93%. That's pretty remarkable. Their union rate was 88%, which is very remarkable in my, my opinion, given the fact that they didn't pre, uh, prepare the joints. They had a complication rate of 19%, which is uh, on par with people with diabetes and complications. They required hardware removal in 11%. But I think what's interesting is we look at their mortality at their average follow-up of three years, more than one third of the patients had died. Patients don't die of their ankle fracture, but these are sick patients. Patients that have diabetic neuropathy uh, probably have autonomic neuropathy of their heart. If they have peripheral artery disease, they have coronary artery disease, they probably have higher risk of stroke. And certainly if they have renal disease, that also contributes. But the bottom line is we're treating sick patients. And I think that this study actually um, makes me think that in these complicated patients, uh, I think they had a very high limb salvage rate of 93%. Um, so this, this causes me to think about uh, maybe I should do this. I still struggle with the fact whether I should prepare joints or not prepare joints, uh, but this would indicate that one doesn't has, have to prepare a joint. So the anecdotal recommendations that I would provide for you in patients with neuropathy would be to uh, consider the rule of doubles. Double your fixation. That could include multiple syndesmotic screws. It could include axial pins, the so-called children's pins. It could be including uh, putting uh, intramedullary fixation up the fibula. Double the non-weight bearing time. Normally that would be uh, about 12 weeks in our patients with diabetes. Double the office visits, do frequent cast changes, and really hope for the best because this is a race between hardware uh, failure and fusion. But even when you do all this, this can happen. This patient ended up with an ankle that didn't move. I didn't go in and re, uh, intervene surgically after this because he developed a foot. He was happy, it was stable, but the x-ray certainly looked uh, terrible. So with ankle fractures and diabetes, I think you have to recognize that these are serious injuries associated with high complication rates, and that includes infection, non-union, malunion, even high rates of amputation. They get impaired wound healing, longer hospital stays, and they're gonna have higher medical complications such as venous thromboembolism, and they're gonna be higher costs associated with them. So I always say that the official orthopedic color is pink. It's a combination of blood, pus, and tears. Thank you for uh, asking me to speak on this and I'll be happy to take any questions at this point in time. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there's a question by Mr. Brian Tizano. Uh, the question is like this, would this push you to encourage operative treatment of stable fractures in neuropathic joints? That the answer is those without medial shoulder widening. I think that um, I would follow them very closely, but it certainly would if they have neuropathy. And I, as I showed you that one x-ray, it looked relatively stable. I think that uh, one would have to follow them very closely and you might see them uh, back in a week and get an x-ray. But I think you have to prove that it's truly stable. Usually bimalleolar fractures are not gonna be stable, even if they look at on the x-ray. Uh, 
I think that there are some good techniques that people can use in a one fracture like that, if you're worried. You can use uh, fixation of the fibula using medullary fixation. Sometimes you can do percutaneous. People are good with minimally invasive uh, techniques of sliding plates. But I think you have to prove that it's stable and you have to watch that patient very, very closely. And I, I think I would err on the side of treating it surgically. Okay, thank you, Prof. Another question by Mr. Omar Hamza. How long do you need pre-op glycemic control? Well, I think that the, the, you can't do much about the hemoglobin A1C, which is a major of three months. But ideally, in the study from, actually there are two studies from Vanderbilt uh, in patients with trauma. And they found that if your perioperative glucose goes over 200, that your increased risk of infection goes way up. We found the same thing. So our goal perioperatively is to keep the glucose below uh, 200 and you need the cooperation of your, of your medical team to do that. The real risk in a diabetic patient perioperatively is not hyperglycemia, but it's in fact hypoglycemia. That's actually dangerous. And so if you look at patients who undergo cardiac surgery, many patients don't have diabetes yet they develop hyperglycemia. The same is true of trauma patients. And in the ICU, they're able to titrate that very well. And they keep their sugar, their blood glucose under 150. That's probably not practical on a normal ward, but I think um, preoperatively, we'd like to see them under 200 and main to maintain it under 200 during the perioperative course. You can't change neuropathy. You can't change the long-term glycemic. If somebody has peripheral artery disease, perhaps, you can get your vascular surgeon to do an angiogram and get you blood circulation, but you really, you really need to uh, look at your risk factors as best you can. Uh, okay, Prof. Another question is, what if there is already a Charcot joint? Would you fix it? Well, I, I think that I'm on one extreme. I, ankle Charcot in particular is not tolerated well. And the reason for that is you tend to develop deformities in the frontal plane. They develop a varus or valgus deformity. Um, sagittal plane deformities are actually tolerated well, but because of our malleoli, if you get a Charcot deformity, you're going to ulcerate over the lateral malleolus or the medial side. If I saw a Charcot, an early Charcot with a neuropathic ankle fracture, I would intervene, but I would go directly to a primary fusion in that case, um, including the hind foot. I think that um, however, the, the method, how you do it, is probably less important than the principles of getting good fixation. Some might choose external fixation. Some might choose internal fixation uh, with a retrograde nail, multiple screws, plate. But I think you have to put a robust construct on. But I would definitely intervene early on a Charcot deformity that shows deformity in the frontal plane. Okay, Prof. There's another question by Jacqueline Capillo. How long would you monitor operative patients postoperatively to monitor for Charcot joints? Oh, I think that you have to monitor them probably for the better part of six months during that in acute inflammatory process. Um, you know, the Charcot joint develops because of inflammation. It, you come in and it's the osteoclast. So I think anytime during that period, um, you know, first of all, they have been the shark, the injury that causes inflammation. Then during the post-operative course, they can develop it uh, when they start the weight bear. I've seen patients at 12 weeks who look beautiful, start their weight bearing process and develop a Charco joint. So to me, until they, they demonstrate absence of a inflammation, and that would be manifested by edema and warmth, uh, I would follow them closely. Quite honestly, in my own personal experience, uh, if possible, I will follow all these patients for the rest of my career and hopefully the rest of their life if I can, because I think if they develop an ankle fracture on one side, they have a risk of developing it on the other side. And also I think the other thing that's an important point to mention um, is that if they have an ankle fracture and I fix it and I keep them non-weight bearing, what about their contralateral side? I think that's very much at risk for a Charcot event because their increased load on that contralateral side. So I think you have to be very vigilant to the contralateral side after this. No, 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 no questions. You can go ahead. Okay. Dr. Um, okay. I have a quick question. So do you have 
any specific uh, system of managing patients with unco like complicated diabetes and morbid obesity? What precautions do you take? Boy, I, I think that the only thing I would do is you have to make their hardware as robust as you can. Um, you know, you would, you know, multiple tetracortical screws. I don't, I don't do it for syndesmosis. I would make sure that I have a bulky fibular plate. Immediately, you might consider a plate. I would even consider a couple of uh, children's pins from the uh, os calcis across the talus and into the distal tibia. Um, basically advise them to be in a wheelchair. And because we know that these patients, it's not that they're necessarily bad patients, but they unknowingly put weight on it because they don't have pain, their neuropathy, they don't uh, really realize it and they do it for transfer. So I think wheelchair advising them to do it. I think uh, it, it's a very challenging thing. The problem is when they have the, um, the morbid obesity at the time of the fracture, there's not a lot you can do for it. If you would see somebody and you were going to electively operate on a Charcot and they were morbidly obese, I would definitely, if I could, if, if everything was stable and they didn't have an ulcer, I would try and get their weight down. I do believe that uh, there's a role for bariatric surgery in a lot of these patients. Their, their glycemic control gets better. It's like doing a total knee or a total hip electively on somebody who's morbidly obese. But unfortunately, we don't have that option if they fracture. Do, do you consider primary fusion in these patients with uh, morbid obesity and uh, diabetes? Is that one of the indication for you? You know, I think, I think fusion is a great operation. If somebody has neuropathy and they develop a, a fracture, I think doing a, you can never go wrong with a primary fusion. I think you actually probably reduce the rate of reoperation and complications because, um, you know, the, the risk of somebody with neuropathy developing a problem uh, with an unstable fracture is high. So I think primary fusion, and I think uh, Sentinel did a primary ankle fusion in an obese patient may be a really, really good indication for doing primary ankle fusion. So I believe it's a, I think based on that article that I showed you, I think that obesity probably should be considered one of those things that make it complicated diabetes. That's a great point. And uh, when you do complicated diabetes, do you do extended uh, antibiotic prophylaxis? Do you put them on antibiotic for longer or do you still stick to the 24 hour antibiotic? That's a good question too. I think that, you know, the, I actually use vancomycin powder intraoperatively. I sprinkle it uh, like they do in the spine literature. And I found in my own personal experience that decreased deep infection rates by 73%. But I, I actually do keep them on oral antibiotics for a little bit longer. I know that there's not a lot of good science for that, but it, you know, I remember when I was in Pittsburgh, which was a transplant capital of the world, they kept everybody on Bactrim for life three times a week. And so to me, I think a, a period of antibiotics orally uh, for, for these patients is, as long as it doesn't cause any harm. I mean, can antibiotic cause harm? Sure. But I think that uh, I actually have started doing this on my Charcot patients and even some of the amputation patients I do. And I know that my infectious disease colleagues would probably uh, not agree with me, but it does make me feel better. And uh, the other question is, you said the infection, you already said what's your uh, protocol with that. And DVT, B. So do you do anything different? What's your DVT prophylaxis for diabetic, uh, complicated diabetic patients? Great question. That's yeah, a great question again. Certainly while they're in the hospital, we generally use uh, some form of heparin, usually low molecular weight. Um, in the foot and ankle literature, there's not any great guidelines on who needs prophylaxis afterwards and who doesn't. Um, I think anybody who has treated ankle fractures for 30 years like I have, has had a patient die of a pulmonary embolism afterwards and it makes you feel sick. Um, so I individualize it. I put everybody on aspirin if possible. Uh, and in really high risk patients, uh, I would consider uh, using uh, something else. Uh, usually it's a low molecular heparin. It's one of the oral medications. Uh, but I think that I would also, if I thought they were really high risk, I would get my medical uh, people involved. And it's interesting, some of them come in already on some oral uh, anti from their coronary artery disease. And we just continue that. But that's a great question. We don't have a lot of guidelines. We have guidelines from the hips and the knees, but ankle, the guidelines are equivocal. There's not support for either uh, or any particular regimen. Uh, 
But how long you use this under trouble prophylaxis? I think that if, you know something like aspirin I would use until they're fully weight bearing. Um, uh -huh. If I were using low molecular heparin uh, or some other pill, again I think it's till they're active and getting around. A lot of them um, patients, you know, if they're non weight bearing, they're remaining active. So I think that I would probably err on the side of um, uh, using it for at least six or twelve weeks if I could. And do you often? Uh, do them as an inpatient, admit them uh, overnight, or do you kind of do them as an outpatient because they are, they are complicated diabetic? Most of the ankle fractures that get this usually present to the emergency department and then get admitted from there and do it. Um, you know, nowadays it's hard to get patients uh, admitted preoperatively, but if I had somebody that had significant comorbidities, coronary artery disease, et cetera, I, I would do that, bring them in and have them uh, seen and cleared uh, in that way as well. I think really the one thing I've learned is that perioperative glycemic control really, really is important. When I was in Pittsburgh, despite my interest in this, we actually looked up my own patient series and looked at how many of them, uh, how often did we have a patient that ended up going over 200? And we found that when we did, the infection rate was significantly higher. But what was most disappointing about it to me was in my own patients, and again, I had medicine involved, Believe it or not, 40% of my own patients didn't even have a, have a post-operative uh, glucose uh, measured in the hospital. And that was really disappointing to me because I thought that I was uh, somebody who was interested in this. And that really changed my whole thought process. Great, very good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Prof, there's one question by Mr. Hetem Asari. Is there any role or can we implant using albumin level to anticipate and optimizing patient before the OR and check for infection? I think that's a great question. And actually it even, it, I think I would even say, forget about it for infection, more importantly for nutrition, because even though these patients are oftentimes uh, overweight, they can be malnourished. So I think albumin and also Pre-albumin is actually even, even better for nutrition because uh, as your uh, colleague mentioned, albumin actually is an acute phase reactant and it will go down in somebody that has an infection. And we actually think that it's a poor predictor. If your albumin is low, um, it's an acute inflammatory response marker. So I think that your outcomes are less and it's also somewhat of a nutritional. So I think that's a great question. And I think somebody who has a low albumin is somebody that we should pay particular attention to because nutritionally they may be depleted, but that also may, uh, may indicate some underlying acute inflammation and even infection. Very, very, that's a great point. Prof, there are two more comments. Uh, one is by Mr. Avnish Chabra. He says, great talk, thanks, Professor. And, oh, he's a good guy. <laughs> and there's another, Tolasa Tibisa. It is very helpful, thank you, Professor. Well, it's my pleasure. I, this is a passion of mine. And, and um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about the metabolic component of this and the illness. I think putting an ankle fracture together, most orthopedic surgeons, we do this all the time and we're comfortable, but why do these things fall apart? And that's the real challenge and to make a difference and prevent amputations in this group. So um, it was my pleasure to do this. Thank you very much. Dr. Okay, I have one last question. So sure. having said that in complicated diabetes, uh, non-operative treatment is not a good option. So is this a group where you would, in a kind of an x-ray that looks like potentially unstable, would you directly go for a surgery without a stress view? This is, would this be a group where you would eliminate a stress view? You know, that's a great question. I think you have to make sure that you prove to yourself that it's stable. One way would be a stress view. Another would be, with, I, think, um, I think you could have them weight bear on it for a week and have them come back and see. I think if you're going to, you have to prove. And the third thing I might even consider, uh, Senthil, is I might get an MRI and look at the bone marrow edema. And the reason is an MRI uh, can show us so much more than the fracture. That MRI may show us that the entire talus lights up, that the entire distal tibia, and that fracture represents something that's much more significant. So I think we should prove that these are inherently stable uh, before we, uh, we uh, treat them non-surgically. If it's a bimolecular injury, I'm gonna probably treat that surgically and, and convince myself that it's unstable. 
a truly undisplaced distal fibular fracture, uh, I would probably keep an eye on. Uh, when I see undisplaced medial malleolar fractures, I get very nervous because, you know, usually you don't see many of those. Uh, you see much more common distal fibula. But I think who did it, and I think an MRI in this case would show us a lot more information about bone marrow edema and actually predict us that much more injuries present than we realize. That's great. And that comment was for Dr. Chabra. Uh, can we go ahead? Yeah, any more questions if you want. I can keep going. Yeah, one more. There is one more question by Tolisa. What type of skin closure technique do you recommend? Another great question. Um, I think that if somebody has an acute ankle fracture, uh, and I say that I'm not doing the surgery today or tomorrow, I actually use a compression dressing similar to a Jones wrap uh, to get their skin down. Ideally, uh, you'd like to get it down so their skin would wrinkle. The, the more experience I've gotten, the less, sub, less deep suture I put in. Uh, I generally only, I'll like a vertical mattress uh, skin suture. Uh, and I've, I've used to use uh, an absorbable suture, I mean, non-absorbable, but I've gone to using a non, an absorbable now because number one, it stays in longer. I use something called uh, uh, monocryl or biosin. Um, and the reason is it can stay in longer than two to three weeks. Not everybody's healed and uh, I don't have to take it out. And I put a nice, and I include a deep layer in it. So I've gone away from using anything uh, in the deep tissue because I found a lot of uh, these absorbable sutures for the deep tissue will actually uh, create minor abscesses and spits. So if I have any problem closing it, uh, I'll use the Algauer Donati modification of it, which is a really nice technique. We learned that from calcaneal fractures and you can put in all your stitches and tag them with hemostats and then you can, you can tie them all at the same time so that you reduce your uh, tension. So I think skin closure is very, very important. Personally, even with my sharp co-reconstructions, I've gone away from using deep suture. Uh, okay, Prof, another question by Mr. Shivakumar. Do you prefer pneumatic boot walker postoperatively in well-fixed table fractures? You know, I think if you had an ultimately a really reliable patient, then I think it can be very, very good. The problem is determining who's reliable, because if you give somebody a boot walker, um, chances are they're going to take it off. I probably would take it off. And, you know, they, and so I think compliance becomes an issue. I think a well padded cast is something that can work very, very well, but I never say never. So in certain patients, I think, uh, you know, uh, a pneumatic a walker can be the right thing. But I think you have to know that patient well. Um, and I'm still, I'm still nervous when I treat these patients. I actually think that something bad's gonna happen until it doesn't, and that makes me happy then. Okay, Prof, no more questions, we can go ahead. Okay, we're all done, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for spending your time with us. And thank you, Dr. Pitch. Yes, thank uh, you. Thank you, Senthil, for making this happen. And I hope uh, we'll be able to do a few more lectures in the near future. Thank you very much. It was great, great doing it. Thank you. Thank you once again, Prof. Stay safe. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Satish. Bye. Bye, 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 Bye. We'll end the meeting. Yeah.